flags on the streets of Tanzania flat half-mast to mark the death from heart failure of President John Pombe Magufuli, a man who is as divisive in death as in life. Hello and welcome back to Africa Sands Focus with me, Sally Amutabi. Samia Suluhu Hassan has been sworn in as the president of Tanzania after the death of President John Magufuli was announced on the 17th of March. While supporters praised his pursuit of development, Magufuli's approach to the coronavirus pandemic was controversial. From May last year, the government stopped publishing data on coronavirus cases and deaths, and in June, Magufuli declared that Tanzania was coronavirus free. Magufuli advocated herbal remedies, and in February, the health minister said the country had no plans to accept COVID 19 vaccines. Officially, Magufuli died from a long term heart condition. He had not been seen in public for more than two weeks, and many people believe he was being treated for coronavirus, which authorities deny. Africa Sands Focus reporter Michael Baruti is in Dar es Salaam, the country's largest city, to find out what Tanzania's coronavirus future might look like. The late President John Magufuli was one of the most popular sons of Africa of this era. He was a very known figure inside and outside of Africa. One of the things that made him so popular is how he led the nation on dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Some people agreed with these methods, some did not agree with them. But what do the health experts think? Angel Dilip is a public health expert. Dr. Angel, what is your take on President Magufuli's approach and policy on handling COVID-19 in Tanzania? Uh, I think uh, President Magufuli um tried a lot to follow all the, all the recommended guidelines uh, from the Ministry of Health in terms of all protective measures like wearing masks, uh, um, avoid unnecessary gatherings, uh, and also practicing um, hand washing with soap and water. But, but of course, there, there's been some challenges in terms of releasing the COVID-19 uh, data in the, in the country. And I think uh, from the public health perspective, I think uh, we have what is called data for decision making. And of course, once we don't have the data, then it's difficult to, to tackle the pandemic. Why uh, do we think data is important? You talked about a little bit about data for decision making. Can you talk about that a little bit more? What does that mean? Okay, data for decision making is that uh, we need to be informed on how best to, to intervene. How many are at risk? You can understand, for example, the magnitude of the problem country-wise. For example, the, the challenge may be, or the cases may be more in one of the regions in Tanzania, the Islam compared to Mtwara, for example, you see. So you know where best to intervene in terms of providing all protective and control measures. So some people are saying that Tanzanians completely ignored science when it comes to addressing COVID-19. Do you, do you think that is the case? No, I don't think we completely ignored uh, science. Uh, I think we followed all the uh, protective and and, uh, and preventive uh, measures. Even the Minister of Health, through all the public health research that has been going on in the country, I think they offered a guideline in terms of conducting research um, in, in a more safe way. So science was not that much ignored. I think the only challenge that, of course, is part of science that was ignored was releasing the, the COVID-19 data. You see, and of course, as, as we said that earlier, we need evidence for decision making. Then there was no that kind of evidence. You know, our, our friends, of course, uh, our, somebody's died, somebody died, but we don't know what, what was the cause of death. So, but again, if you look, compare from last year until today, I think a lot of people has just uh, passed away. Mortality has very much increased. So people are just very much worried on what's going on. So I think the government has the law to the Minister of Faith to say something or what is going on so that people are informed and they take all precautions against the, the pandemic. Thank you. Shortly before his death, Magufuli said publicly that Tanzanians should take precautionary measures against the virus, such as wearing a face mask. But COVID-19 statistics remain a secret. 
Reporter Michael Baruti hit the streets of Dar es Salaam to find out what the people of Tanzania want the government to do now. This is Steve, who asked that we do not use his full name. It's been here now for two years. It, started, it came in our country last year in March. That's the first case we began to, to hear. Then later on, on, on August to, no, to September, we started hearing that the, people, the number of people who've been affected or been dying has, has decreased and people are comfortable. But still, still now, the disease is there, it's out there. People should take precautions. It's not about the, the, the government thing. It's all about you yourself. It starts from your, you. So my fellow Tanzania, my fellow people in Dar es Salaam, the city where I am, we should take precautions. We don't have to wait until the government tells us to, uh, to take precautions. You know that it's the, the, the pandemic is there. The government loves its people and they'll, they'll still they'll publish more and, tell, uh, and try to remind people that they should take precaution on the matter of this COVID-19. What, uh, uh, what is it that the government should do right now? Or what is it that the government can do right now to make you happy and see that, you know what, we are taking this thing serious? My, my belief is that it doesn't have to be the government to tell us that there's a, there's, there's, there's a, a disease that kills, kills people and it's there in Dar es Salaam or in Tanzania or in everywhere. You as you should take precautions of yourself. If you don't have anything, any, any unnecessary movement to do, lock on yourself, keep, uh, keep distance with people, wear a mask, use sanitizer all the time, wash hands, and just try to be safe for you and for your family. Fatma says it's too early to tell whether the government will change its approach to COVID-19. Michael caught up with her at her office building where staff and construction workers were wearing masks and observing social distancing. So, personally, I don't think there's anything that the government can do differently that they have not done. Maybe the major enforcement of what has already been said. It's a viral disease, it's a pandemic, and it's here to stay for a very long time. It's something that the whole world is dealing with right now. You have countries like South Africa where people have been observing lockdowns and then it has resulted to depression. You have people who've been going through depression, people committing suicide, um, economic impacts uh, through the lockdowns. So I, I do believe each country can do the effective measures according to what they have in their country, the problems that we're facing, and how capable are we to have a lockdown, how capable are we to have people go through um, various uh, methods that they would feel are more effective. Yes. You feel like right now people are going to be a little bit more uh, comfortable to talk about COVID-19 openly, because that wasn't the case previously. That wasn't the case. Yes, from what I used to hear, although I could openly talk about COVID-19 personally, I'm okay. very outspoken, yeah. but there was different sources and misinformation going around. So everybody had different um, ways of how they think the disease could be contracted, or what it does to you, and it, it misinformed a lot of people. So they used a different method of controlling that information by trying to put a halt on how people would address it out in the public so that they don't misinform and create a scare or hysteria for other people. But I think right now, maybe people would feel like it's, they would feel safer to just speak out because maybe the administration in place wouldn't really mind. But then yet again, it's too early to tell. We don't know if that's the case. But Deepra takes a different view of the government's handling of COVID-19. Um, to be honest, um, I did not like the way, I might say, the government handled the COVID-19 situation at all. Our late president uh, was very influential, was very influential, and whatever that he says, there's a lot of people who will follow. So I was thinking if he will be, I mean, he will say, he will tell people to take some measure, on wearing a mask, washing hands, using sanitizer, even if, to me, I always say, um, he could have always said there's no corona in Tanzania, but still, our neighbor countries have corona. Um, so let's take measures just in case it comes to a country. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think if he said something like that, like, we don't have corona, but please 
wear face mask, wash your hands, use sanitizers, avoid uh, mass places. Maybe yeah. could have done something. Yeah. So we have a new president now who has yeah. just been in today, who has just been sworn in today. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there will be a new change of approach? Do we think there will be a new approach on how Tanzania as a country is dealing with COVID-19? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Even if someone has another way of handling a certain situation, still because they don't want to be different from what the government is implying or... No, no. Do you think it was safe for government not to give away any statistics about uh, COVID-19? No, it wasn't. Mm. No, it wasn't. Because um, I think that would have created awareness mm. to people. Yes, they say um, fear is not good and all that, but trust me, better tell the truth. Mm. Better tell the truth. What no matter how people are going to take it. With the new president in place now, Will Tanzania adopt a new approach of addressing the pandemic or will it stick to the current approach? This is what everyone is waiting to see. Michael Baruti in Dar es Salaam for Africa Science Focus. What do you think will happen now in Tanzania? Let us know via Twitter at SciDevNet and we'll have more contact details at the end of the show. Next up, we have a question about disease outbreaks from Gilbert Nakwea, and our answer comes from Dr. Eohe Akase, an infectious disease specialist at Lagos University Teaching Hospital. How does uh, the outbreak of Ebola in Guinea and Congo help Africa prepare you know, resilient systems to handle future pandemics? This is a very this is a very good question, and I think uh, these uh, outbreaks have given us a very good opportunity to strengthen our healthcare system. Because one, you agree with me, and I think we've been on the ground. We're saying to a large extent that the our surveillance and epidemiologic structures are markedly improved in terms of how we respond to you know outbreaks in terms of you know surveillance for where are the hotspots, contact tracing both describing outbreaks and also responding so that because the the key thing around epidemiologic tools are that they help you to describe where is the outbreak happening why is it happening who are those at risk this helps you to put in place structures and mobilize the resources for effective response two um is the issue around molecular diagnostics I remember when Ebola came, uh, there were only one or two places in the whole of Nigeria that could make a diagnosis for Ebola. There were times when some other countries had to ship their samples out to other African countries to make a diagnosis for them, you know, reference laboratories. Because of COVID, we have, the, we have seen a large, you know, um, rollout of molecular diagnosis, so much so that in Lagos State, where I work, for example, we have a capacity for molecular diagnosis, you know, getting towards 50 laboratories in Lagos that can make, you know, can make a diagnosis of COVID based on molecular, you know, uh, platforms. And this is the same thing with other states in the country, as well as other countries in Africa. So uh, this has prepared us to respond appropriately by increasing our capacity for molecular diagnosis. Many thanks to Gilbert and Dr. Eohe Akase. Do you have a question you'd like answered? Send us a text or voice message via WhatsApp to plus 254-799-042513. And we'd love to hear your feedback on Africa Science Focus. You'll find a link to a quick survey in this episode's details page. Today's program was produced by Harrison Lewis. The editors were Fiona Broom and Jackie Oparafatoe, with reporting from Michael Baruti. I'm Sally Amutabi. See you next Wednesday. This program was funded by the European Journalism Center through the European Development Journalism Grant Program with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation.